This is uh, Gender and Politics for April, Tuesday, April 14th, uh, 2021. Uh, what I'm going to do in class today is finish our discussion of Wollstonecraft. And, and in these remarks, um, uh, provide some background for Friedan, primarily by highlighting and tracing some developments in feminist thought and act, activism from uh, the period of Wollstonecraft, who initiates modern feminism. To Friedan today, so uh, this will be a fairly short preview today. And um, so, if you're looking at the notes, um, I uh, uh, I want to just make some brief comments and highlight the uh, character and influence of Margaret Fuller, who lived from 1810 to 1850, very Nathaniel Hawthorne, and uh, uh, so, uh, if you um, follow along, uh, I'll just uh, quickly dance over some of these interesting characters and suggest how they form the background for Friedan, the modern uh, sameness feminism, and women's liberation. Margaret Fuller was um, a visible and influential thinker in America, a transcendentalist, a, an associate of uh, Thoreau and em Emerson, and and I would put her more on the sameness feminist uh, continuum. She reflected clearly some of Wollstonecraft's agenda, but generally she tends to advocate for broader social reform. She participated in the book farm experiment, uh, the socialist living experiment that Hawthorne and others participated in. Hawthorne eventually uh, satirized her in the character of Zenobia in um, uh, The Lies of the Romance. <laughs> and some ways thought that, and her criti his criticism, I think, of her feminism, which was, I think, a criticism of much of the, uh, the tendency of romantic and transcendental romantic thought in America in Europe and transcendentalist thought in America, which was utopian and therefore had a tendency to advocate changes in human life, which were divorced from the complex reality. Um, uh, Hawthorne. Typically, he's not defined as a feminist or described as one, but I make that argument in my article, Women in the Novels of Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, that he was probably a different feminist. Um, like Wollstonecraft, he was uh, steeped in the natural rights tradition, but unlike some of his contemporaries in the transcendental movement and even in European romanticism, such as Rousseau, etc., um, Hawthorne probably thought that, again, that the reformist impulse in modern thought um, could ultimately do more damage than good uh, uh, if it was uncontained by a grasp of the complex nature of human nature, as I said earlier, uh, and especially on the question of gender. Um, uh, I think Hawthorne, uh, and this is why I would classify him and do in my article, uh, and that's why I define, by the way, feminism, which I use in this course, as the movement uh, to reform society and personal relationships so that no one man has more power over any particular woman or that men as a class have power over women. Um, uh, I actually formulated that definition in that article. And, and, and I think he represents uh, the orientation towards the question of gender identity that many different feminists do. Uh, the other author will examine uh, some brief excerpts of her thought. It was very influential in, in emergence of feminism in the 1970s and 80s was Carol Gilligan in a different voice. Um, John Stuart Mill, very influential libertarian thinker um, in the great philosophy of liberty in the uh, 19th, hundred, 19th century, um, um, was also a self-avowed feminist, one of the most important male authors in feminism, by the way, in history. And, uh, and generally speaking, was more radical than Wollstonecraft uh, and probably anticipates some of um, uh, the more radical dimensions of feminism in the 1970s, but also currents in human thought. Uh, 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 John Rawls' theory of justice, very influential on equality and, and uh, liberty in the 1970s and 80s in this country and, and actually worldwide. And Ronald Dworkin, I think, share aspects of Millsian liberty. Mills is the author of the great principle that uh, you are free to do whatever you want as long as you don't harm somebody else. 
uh, which is the core of libertarianism and um, and probably again more of a sameness feminism in that I think he argued that it wasn't enough just to give women political power and even economic power. There had to be some kind of ecological unity. And we'll see, by the way, that's important to think of this for Friedan. The difference, uh, it, Friedan really uh, uh, conveys the modern feminist sense that the core subjugation of women isn't political. It is political, of course. It isn't economic. It is economic. It isn't just social. It's psychological. And, uh, and as you're going to see, Friedan's feminism is kind of at its core a psychological liberation from uh, um, gender stereotypes. That's the mystique and the feminine mystique. Um, the suffragette movement is probably one of the most important modern reform political and social movements in history. I don't have too much to say about it, and, and uh, there, I have examined its documents before, but, and its most fam famous document in America was the Identical Falls Declaration from 1848. And of course, it was a successful movement in that it advocated for women's suffrage and achieved that both in Europe and uh, in America. Um, the interesting thing, though, is is that uh, uh, it's it's different in its approach uh, from sameness feminism or from the feminism uh, of the more radical feminisms of the 20th century, uh, in that its aim was not so much to to uh, uh, eliminate differences between men and women rather to give women as women a political voice, often on the grounds that there was a distinct female voice from the male voice. And and the aim of emp empowering women politically was to give political effect to that uh, female point of view or domestic point of view, uh, the, the, the woman's point of view on, on the grounds that it would transform larger politics, uh, uh, perhaps uh, make uh, uh, international politics less bellicose. Um, and it, almost like a non, uh, it's a non-comic version of uh, Aristophanes' uh, Lisa Strata or uh, Ecclesia Zeusai, the Assembly of Women. Um, so uh, again, uh, I'll, but this was a movement, it wasn't a philosophy. And uh, as a movement, uh, there, were, there was a whole variety of different ideologies, all the way from more radical ones to, um, to pretty traditional views of men and women. Tocqueville probably uh, represents this kind of uh, feminism in democracy in America and argues that in, in some ways um, uh, uh, that there's a new view of the sexism emerging in this country. In some ways, the suffragette movement would be the correction to Aristotle's understanding that women should be primarily domesticist. But, but if you wanted to coin a phrase uh, that might describe its thrust, Aside from the more radical elements or transformative ideological elements, you could call it political domesticism. That, um, and in some ways, the example, the most remarkable example, also a successful political movement in the uh, in America, was the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union, the prohibit the, the prohibitionists. Uh, and in some ways, it was the issue of prohibition that probably dovetailed with the issue of suffrage suffragism that. Um, that pro that led to not only the 18th Amendment, the elimination of alcohol, etc., but also the 19th Amendment, the granting of suffrage and, and, um, and the votes to women. So uh, clearly a critical stage in, in, in modern uh, experience of gender and thinking about gender, but, but different in many respects from what eventually replaces it as women's liberation or modern feminism. Charlotte Perkins Gil Gilman, who lived from 1860 to 1935, a very interesting character, very controversial character, um, uh, famous for her essay, uh, The Yellow Wallpaper, which explores aspects of depression and, and, and certain issues in, in psychotherapy, but, uh, but also the, product, the producer of a very interesting novel, which was not as well known. It was serialized uh, in her time and has probably been, like, like Wollstorff, Stonecraft to some degree, been rediscovered by modern scholarship and feminists, uh, her land. Uh, in which three American uh, explorers uh, accidentally crash and discover um, uh, uh, in South America this Amazonian uh, society of consisting only women that 2,000 years earlier uh, was cut off from the larger society and then and then uh, eventually uh, there were only a few men uh, and and the miracle happened and the miracle in the book is it's why it's kind of science fictiony uh, is um, is that uh, is that all of a sudden parthenogenesis enables 
after the death of the last remaining men, uh, parthenogenesis enables the society to exist uh, as uh, only women. And there are two kinds of women in the society, those who can do the miracle of parthenogenic, parthenogenetic birth uh, and, and those who are drones in effect. So uh, in this book, uh, uh, women, of course, come to occupy all the uh, psychological, economic, and political uh, aspects of men. So in some ways, it, 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 as I suggest, it, it points forward to uh, the most radical feminist that we'll read in this course, which is Shulamit Firestone. Um, uh, uh, Perkins thought that, the, that in some ways, private eros and heterosexual eros was what lit, entrapped both men and women. And, and, uh, and uh, the, the novel ends with three interesting pairings because the, the question that the women's society faces, because they know they're eventually going to be discovered as the rest of the world catch up, catch, catches up to them technologically. And after all, the three Americans crash through their plane. Uh, so they, they know that others are coming. So uh, rulers of her land engineer pairing between the three Americans and three women. And um, the hardest, um, uh, things that the men struggle with is one not trying to dominate the women but also letting go of the idea of private erotic feeling and attachment uh perkins seems to suggest that true liberation won't come until not only of course men and women do all the same things in society it's androgynous in that sense uh and uh but also until uh, uh women and men replace erotic attachment and passion love with a kind of a diffuse friendship as you'll see, in some ways, that's also the vision that um, uh, Firestone promulgates in the dialectic. In the 20th century, probably prior to the women's movement, the two most influential feminist thinkers were Virginia Woolf, of course, a great literary talent, and and um, and, and Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, um, Woolf, uh, an interesting essay, A Room of One's Own, is more a complaint that women of genius are are kind of crowded out or or, or or discouraged from developing their genius, and therefore, like Wollstonecraft, like like uh, most feminists, uh, De Beauvoir, uh, I'm sorry, Wolf argues the problem is is that um, women's talents are not developed, it, and her concern seems to be more with liberating women of genius so that women's genius can take uh, their place along with the men of genius. Although obviously she points to larger social and political reforms, De Beauvoir is probably the most important ideological feminist of the 20th century, prior to an outside of American feminism or the women's movement. Um, and uh, she points to the incalculable influence uh, that two other wider philosophies or ideologies have had upon the question of gender, uh, Marxism and existentialism. Um, uh, Beauvoir was a French existentialist. And as I suggest in my notes, uh, her feminism is more a result of applying the larger implications of existentialism to the specific questions of gender. Uh, and uh, and you'll see her influence in some ways is, is, is discernible, not only in Friedan, also certain Marxist implications, the, the centrality of, of labor as defining human trait uh, that gives not only a, a, a objective meaning to a, a person's identity, but, but it, it, what de Beauvoir uh, uh, contributes is the idea from existentialism that each individual should be radically free to construct his or her own identity, and that nature or divinity or the larger universe supplies no authoritative guidance or information for who and what we are, not only as men and women, but of course as, as human beings in general. And, um, and she is, uh, we'll talk about the larger philosophy of existentialism just as an introduction and I talk about it in my notes here. She's also the language of the interesting notion of the other, of othering, which has become critical, not only in terms of feminist uh, 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 thinking, but also gay and lesbian and transcendent, uh, transgender. Um, and the larger uh, uh, orientation on the left, that, that the dominance of male patriarchal Eurocentric structures have othered uh, women, uh, uh, sexual minorities, uh, such as homosexuals uh, and transgenders, but also colonialism and, and, and colonial peoples. So de Beauvoir, in some ways, is, is a profounder thinker, as I suggest in my notes. Does that mean the truth of her gender 
uh, reform of her feminism depends upon your acceptance or rejection of the larger philosophy of existentialism, perhaps. Um, so, as we'll see, this all sets up a consideration for Friedan, who, in some ways, the interesting thing about Friedan's book is not that she begins with a larger ideology, whether it's Enlightenment, uh, natural rights, or, or, or Marxism, or existentialism. When you read The Feminine Mystique, her beginning point is, she would claim, I think, that her beginning point is not ideological. She doesn't start out with an ideology and then tries to recast gender or the issues of gender within that larger ideology, whether it's in the Enlightenment, natural rights, uh, Marxism, or existentialism, but rather she begins with an empirical fact. And the empirical fact that she begins with is the psychological widespread, uh, at least as she observes it in herself and in her compatriots in their late 50s and early 60s, with the malaise that, that hangs over American women. Um, and of course, the background to the feminine mystique is, is, is Rosie the Riveter. Uh, and, and in some ways, in the same way that World War II and, and the massive uh, bringing together of millions of human beings, men into the army and women into the workforce, um, changed the nature of American society and led in some ways to the civil rights movement because the desegregation of the armed forces was really the first, uh, under Truman, was the first great uh, uh, political influence of, of uh, uh, post-war influence and transformative uh, power because millions of American men were uprooted from their society and, 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 and moved to base camps and found their, their uh, uh, sort of taken out of their, their uh, uh, traditional and domestic situations. So, uh, but then also, of course, um, the enlistment of large numbers of African American men and et cetera led to the perception that the, the, the segregation of, of, of white and black in society was a kind of artificial and not productive thing probably led to the beginnings of the civil rights. Uh, hold on one second. Um, so anyway, uh, I hope this helps place the feminine mystique in, in a certain uh, background and we'll explore um, Dan's thought uh, today and probably next week.